are in listen-only uh, mode. Had some issues we were dealing with, which we didn't quite complete, but we're uh, determined to to uh, meet later. And so we'll do this session first. Uh, there are still four or five seats here. I know it's crowded and I'm sweating, but uh, you're welcome to come and sit down. Um, so what we're trying to go through here first are the regulatory proposals uh, that were commented on by the, the PAG and the conference board that we didn't get to. Was there one other thing? So, so yeah, so the regulatory proposals, they're from agency work, so we intend to go through that. Uh, we, I greatly enjoyed, uh, greatly appreciated uh, the comments this morning uh, through the Commerce Board and the PEG and the public relative to catch limits, uh, relative to the bycatch stuff. Uh, we're not going to bring that up here again. We're uh, considering those. Of course, there will be a vote on it in the morning. As you know, on Friday morning, we'll show up and we'll figure out where, where all of those things go. But, but here we're going to try to go through the regulatory proposals for the rest of the afternoon. It's already 3 o'clock in. So, Bruce, which is the first one? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just remind you that there was uh, the 2A licensing proposal from the staff, which had been done in conjunction with the Pacific Council to change the licensing deadlines. But that was what was reviewed on Monday, and it will be showing up again tomorrow morning on your, on your presentation. So we will vote on it in the morning, but Correct. we've aired that here. Correct. So the first one, Mr. Chairman, is the uh, we'd like to have um, NIMS management staff and, and ADF and G talk to us about the uh, 2C3A cat sharing plan. Um, I think Mr. Mr. Myers has a presentation on that. Thank you. Um, I'm Jane DeCosimo. I'm staff with the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. Uh, and Scott Meyer is here from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and uh, jointly we will update you on a new process that you are undertaking uh, this year. We've been telling you for a number of years that we are moving in this direction, and the uh, catch hearing plan for 2C and 3A was implemented or is in effect as of uh, January 13th. So this is our, our new paradigm. So uh, behind your, in your briefing book, section 16.2.2 is the letter from the North Pacific Fishery Management Council to uh, Dr. Lehman that uh, conveys uh, some background information on the development of the catch hearing plan for 2C and 3A and its contents. And um, along with the council recommendation for an action that you would uh, implement through the annual management measures when you adopt the cat sharing plan uh, during your action session on Friday. So that's the kind of the big picture summary and I will take you through a little bit more of the detail of the cat sharing plan and the new role or relationship that uh, we have between the council Alaska Department of Fish and Game, National Marine Fishery Service, and the Commission for Implementing Management Measures for the Guided Sport Fishery in those two IPHC regulatory areas. So if you have um, uh, the letter handy um, dated December 23, 2013, there's also copies in the blue book for members of the public if they wish to track. Uh, this is 16.2.2 in your book. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, catch hearing plan is in effect, uh, and it replaces a guideline harvest level program that has been uh, in, in effect for the last decade or so. Um, so under the catch hearing plan, the um, expectation under the plan is that the commission will set a combined charter and commercial catch limit for area 2C, separate from that combined catch limit for area 3A. Each sector's catch limit will be reduced by estimates of its discard mortality rate. And it might be handy uh, for the commissioners and the public if they want to kind of track along with the document that follows the letter, which is a, 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 uh, the catch hearing plan itself. And it contains uh, more of the, the detailed 
uh, information. And if you were to track along on the second page of the catchering plan itself, you'll see how the process is uh, different using the, the type of figure that the commission uses to describe the sequence of events and where removals um, uh, occur as the uh, staff works its way through the stock assessment. You'll see that the bottom third of that figure shows this um, this new process where a combined catch limit for Area 2C and 3A uh, is adopted by the Commission and then um, by virtue of adopting the catch sharing plan, then the charter allocation and the commercial allocation happens automatically based on, on the Council and the National Marine Fisheries Service implementation of the actual plan itself. Uh, the estimate of charter wastage is uh, subtracted from the charter allocation to get the actual catch limit for the charter sector. And then similarly, the IPHC estimate of commercial directed fishery wastage comes off of the commercial allocation and the remainder is what is uh, apportioned to the commercial IFQ sector for uh, issuance of the, of the actual IFQs associated with the quota shares in that, in that program. So that's a snapshot of the new process. Uh, and uh, it's important to note that uh, the catchering plan does contain a number of elements. Um, I went through the specification of the um, annual combined catch limits itself. Uh, however, there are a number of different uh, tiers of allocation depending on the um, IPHC determination of the combined catch limit. So you'll see on page three of the catch sharing plan, there are three tiers for area 2C, and the following page shows that there are five tiers for area 3A, again, depending basically on uh, biomass abundance that leads itself through the stock assessment process into what the actual combined catch limits would be. I'm not going to go into uh, the detail in terms of uh, how those were derived and specifically what they are, but the uh, Council letter on its second page shows uh, that uh, the uh, allocation of, that we use the blue line as a, as a baseline in the absence of knowing what your decision would be for the combined catch limit, uh, we use the blue line uh, as the basis for um, a number of assumptions that we use to uh, generate an analysis that Mr. Meyer will uh, cover and is the basis for the council recommendations for the specific uh, management measures that um, the council is hoping that you will adopt. Uh, so the catchering plan has the allocations and then it also on page four of the catchering plan document itself describes the annual process for setting charter management measures and it's described in that paragraph on page four and, and I also um, will speak to um, the letter which described how that annual process was uh, implemented uh, by the council in 2013 to, to come to the recommendation that it made, uh, made for you in December. Uh, the council has a committee um, of charter halibut uh, stakeholders for Area 2C and 3A. Um, they recommended a, a larger suite of management measures uh, for its initial consideration at an October meeting with, the pub, with themselves, the staff, and other members of the public. Uh, from that October meeting, it narrowed down the um, list of potential management measures for analysis by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game sport fish staff, basically Mr. Meyer, and, and, uh, and others who contributed to that analysis. And then from that analysis, which I won't go into, Mr. Meyer will cover in more detail when I'm done with the introductory remarks, um, the uh, analysis uh, provided uh, sufficient information for the Charter Committee to uh, select preferred management measures, specific management measures for council consideration. And you'll see that on the second page of the letter, uh, in the bold, you'll see that ultimately through that process, um, the council recommended a one fish daily bag limit and a reverse slot limit of less than or equal to 44 inches or greater than or equal to 76 inches for that one fish. 
and it provided some additional guidance, again, because we were forced to use um, some assumptions, not having the council make the decision prior to the commission making its decision. We're in a out-of-sequence uh, course of events, so we're doing our best to uh, make some assumptions um, and um, uh, on, on what your action might be, and, and maybe we need to come back and talk a little bit about that sequence, uh, perhaps at, 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 at the end of the presentation, to see if there isn't a better way to, to do this. Um, and so the additional guidance is that if the final charter allocation, based on the combined catch limit that the Commission adopts tomorrow, is sufficiently higher than the blue line, which was our baseline assumption, to accommodate a change in the reverse slot limit, the council recommends adjusting the size of the lower limit up one inch to 45 inches. The next adjustment, if there is still sufficient room under that uh, limit, uh, would be to reduce the upper limit to meet the allocation. So what the council's recommending is to, is to um, maximize that charter allocation to the greatest degree it can with the combination with the one fish of the lower and upper limits. Uh, a similar recommendation was made for Area 3A. Um, you'll, you'll note that this is the first time that Area 3A is uh, not going to end up with a two fish of any size bag limit. Uh, so, um, it, however, that, that two fish bag limit is, is of critical importance. And so the recommendation is to have the two fish daily bag limit with the maximum size of the second fish equal to 29 inches and a third measure, which is a one trip per day. That is, the limit is for each vessel would be limited to one trip per calendar day. The additional guidance that the council provides to the commission, if there's sufficient uh, uh, room, uh, that the trip limit component of the management measures be the first um, measure to, rem to not adopt. Uh, and the measures would be only the two fish daily bag size limit, one of which is equal to or less than 29 inches, and then as needed, the size of the second fish may be adjusted up or down to meet the allocation. Um, I, I think an, another uh, issue that is important, and I think Mr. Meyer will touch on this also, is um, the discussion that the commissioners had earlier today regarding the blue line and the um, identification of a blue line in and of itself. Uh, this whole process that um, we have been uh, undergoing in this cycle with, the, with this first implementation of the catch sharing plan depends on some identification of a harvest strategy to use as a baseline if um, the relationship, the, t the, the timing I should say, the, the sequence of events continues to be the way they are where the council is meeting prior to the commission uh, in terms of making the recommendation. If there was somehow s sufficient time for the Commission to make its decision first, then have the committee meet, the staff provide an analysis, and the Council act, and still be able to get those measures in your annual uh, management measures uh, for publication in the Federal Register, that, that would be the ideal sequence of events. We know what your combined catch limit is, and we analyze to that level. However, now we're, we're in a somewhat more awkward uh, situation where we're, we're having to make assumptions about what your uh, ultimate action is. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a blue line per se, we're just using that vernacular because that has been the commission vernacular. But if, there, if we have identified for us a harvest strategy to use as a baseline, we would use that. So I guess that's sufficient for the moment. Um, there's additional detail in the catch sharing plan on um, the guided angler fish, which is, is really just you know, part of the domestic action. Um, but I, do, I also do want to note that um, as part of the catch sharing plan in perpetuity is a prohibition on the retention of halibut by skipper and crew uh, in both areas. And so that's, that's one that's al already factored into the analysis uh, that Fish and Game staff uh, provided the Council, and that is an unchanging component of uh, the management measures that would, are already in effect for the charter sector. And, and maybe I'll, I'll take a break and see if there are questions for me, otherwise there additional clarity probably will be, I'm sure, additional clarity will be provided uh, by Mr. Meyer. Thank you, Jane. 
don't look forward to any near-term solution of the sequence. <laughs> Having said that, let's have Bob's comment. <clears throat> Jane, uh, you've seen the um, uh, PAG and Conference Board recommendations for 3A and 2C. Do e either one of those uh, trigger anything that um, in, in the catch sharing plan? Thank, thank you, Mr. Uh, the chairman, Mr. Commissioner, um, uh, Mr. Meyer is going to address um, uh, that issue, and we'll we'll take you through a decision matrix, so to speak, um, regarding the recommendations from both of those groups. Okay. Just a, a quick question: um, the <clears throat> conversion factor between IF two pounds and GAF will be roughly the average size of a sports caught fish in the previous year or something like that? Is that how? Good, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Boyce, the first year of the program, it's the average weight of uh, fish in the last, uh, maybe Rachel can help me, the last year before there was a size limit. Yeah, so it would be based on the 2010 um, data in Area 2C and the 2013 data in 3A. But each year, uh, there's a reporting requirement with GAF, so the length of all GAF fish has to be recorded on a, either the back of the permit or a data sheet issued with the permit, as well as electronically, as well as electronically daily, on a daily basis. So they will have an, an average weight of GAF fish at the end of the first year of implementation, and that would be the average weight you use in year two, and that would just continue on like that. To follow up, I might not be thinking this through, but um, I think this would lead to a tendency for people to try and release smaller fish and catch larger fish, some kind of high grading driven by the fact that they were, you know, maybe they, the conversion rate had been 10 or 12 or 15 pounds, but they'd be beating the system if they could find a bigger fish. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Boyce, that, that, that could happen, and then the next year it would catch up to them in that the higher, if they hire, harvest higher fish, then those fish will have a, a, lar a higher average weight, and then when they buy X many pounds or lease X many pounds of quota from someone, a, a larger average weight will be used to convert their uh, poundage to the number of fish they can harvest that year. So. It should be a self-regulating kind of thing. Thank you. Um, Jane gave a good introduction and actually probably touched on a couple things that should save me some time. Well, um, as she mentioned, that uh, we looked at, uh, Jake, could you fire up that? OK. <clears throat> uh, there is a. PowerPoint firing up slowly as the projector warms up. Um, Jay mentioned that uh, we had, were asked to analyze a number of alternatives, and I won't go through them all. I just want to focus on the ones that the council chose and explain the, um, the intricacies of those, and then, and then walk you through an example of uh, how you would use the, the same data tables that the council used if you were to approve a catch limit that's different than, that resulted in a uh, allocation to the charter sector that was different than the blue line, how to, how to proceed through those tables. Okay, so skipping ahead through the preliminary information here. All right, so uh, here's some uh, basic principles. So we're talking about 2014. If you recall from my earlier presentation, the council adopted, starting with the catch sharing plan, the use of charter logbook data to monitor and manage this fishery. So um, all of the projection harvest forecasts and all of the calculations that were done in the analysis were done using logbook data. And also crew harvest will be prohibited in 2C and 3A, so crew harvest was removed from those logbook data so that the forecast would not be biased by the crew harvest. 
And also with the catch sharing plan, release mortality in the sport fishery, O26 release mortality is included in the charter allocation that's the percentage allocation or fixed amount that's part of the catch sharing plan. So uh, rather than try to break that apart in the analysis, it was much cleaner to just uh, always include release mortality in the estimates that you're going to see and all the calculations. So I'll refer to them as total charter removals. Okay, I'm just, I, because I'm skipping around here, I want to be careful I don't miss something. All right, so the first step uh, in the analysis for, for either area was to uh, provide the status quo projection under the status quo regulations. If we're uh, looking at area 2C, that was a U45068 reverse slot limit. And the... Um, as I said earlier, oh, this this is uh, this. You can follow along in the re, the written report, which is uh, tab sixteen two one, and this would be table three, figure four from that report. Um, as I said earlier, this this logbook data with the crew harvest excluded, and the harvest forecasts are done by sub area using the uh, existing time series of logbook data, the crew removed. The average weight that I used for the status quo forecast is the, act the average of the last two years. We've had the U45068 limit in 2012 and 2013 in Area 2C. So I used the average weight from each sub-area in the last two years to uh, plug in for the average weight for each sub-area. And that's, uh, you multiply those through to get the, the harvest or the yield in pounds. And then the uh, release mortality estimates that I gave you earlier, the magnitude of that release mortality was about 5% relative to the harvest. So I inflated the yield by 5%, basically multiplied yield by 1.05 to come up with the total removals for each area. And you see that that added up to... Uh, 856,000 pounds. So with a forecast, harvest forecast for next year of 58,000 fish, we get a total removal of 856,000 pounds. And uh, that's, that's an important number to remember because in the next table, uh, or in a table coming up here, we'll come back to that number. So skipping ahead now to the reverse slot limit, is 18, this one. So this is just a pictorial representation of the reverse slot limit. I'm sure you all know what it is, but just quickly, uh, it says U43062. This is a recycled slide from an old council uh, document. That's just an example. Uh, you can ignore that and just think of the reverse slot limit there. Before the slot limit, you have a size distribution. This is somewhat what the size distribution looked like in 2010 in Area 2C. And then when you, when you uh, put the, the reverse slot limit in place, um, a critical assumption of this analysis is that, is that the regulation won't affect the number of fish harvested. And that may seem questionable at first, but what we saw in 2011 when we put in the maximum size limit and again in 20. Uh, 12, 2013, is that the, the number of fish was relatively constant. It, wasn't, it didn't appear to be affected by the implementation of a size limit. The one fish bag limit, of course, had a huge effect on harvest. It had a, about exactly this, the effect that we would have predicted, but, um, but putting in a size limit had relatively small effect on, on harvest. And it, even if there was a change in harvest from when you put the size limit in, or from the year before until you put the size limit in, you wouldn't know how much of that change was actually caused by the size limit versus just changes in harvest from one year to the next. A lot of factors affect harvest. Um, but the idea is in this analysis, you're, you're basically assuming that all the fish that are caught in that protected slot that are not legal to keep would be replaced in the harvest by fish that are legal to keep in the tails of the distribution. And so what you see at the lower graph is just a redistribution of that harvest in proportion to the uh, amount of harvest that's above and below those limits. So it's a sort of a graphical representation of the before and after of a reverse slot limit. 
Okay, so uh, jumping ahead, I promised you'd see this number again. Um, you know, annual limits were in the slew of measures that um, the charter sector wanted to see analyzed, but the council didn't adopt any annual limits. So please ignore all of the columns except the far most right column where there is no annual limit, which is where we're at. Um, so we've had this reverse slot limit the last two years, and we've had a methodology that predicts the average weight under the reverse slot limit, and that results in yield projections. And what we've seen is that um, the average weight has been considerably lower than what this projection methodology would, would predict. And part of the reason is that um, the methodology has predicted that more fish over the upper limit would be caught than we actually saw harvested. And that it turns out the average weight of fish under the lower limit is lower than what the method projected. And both years we had a very similar average weight in area 3A, or excuse me, 2C, uh, 2012, the average weight was 14.3 pounds. Last year it was 14.1 pounds. And the, the projections using the reverse slot limit projection methodology were off quite a bit. In fact, in this analysis, we predict that for the status quo for the U45068, you'd have a charter removals of 953,000 pounds. But if you use the average weight from the last two years, just plug that in, you get 856,000 pounds, which is the number I showed you before. And that's a difference of 11.3%. So rather than continue to use a number that we know is, is going to be a considerable over-projection, we look at that percent difference and use it to tune the projection methods in the next table. And so all this is a lead up to explaining the next table so that you're not confused. And the next table is uh, table six from the written report. And this shows the, the projected yields, or excuse me, projected total charter removals under the combination of different upper and lower limits for the reverse slot limit. You've got the lower limits on the left and the upper limits on the right, excuse me, across the top. Um, so uh, the, sh the shaded cells, the sort of green shaded cells, sorry those came out so dark, they look different on every different projector or computer, I should say. Um, those represent the, uh, the cells. They, those index the, the size limits that would correspond to the, the most liberal size limit that would keep you below the blue line of 760,000 pounds. You see each one of those cells, if you, if you move the uh, upper limit to the left or the lower limit downward, you would, you'll exceed 760,000 pounds. But we know that we're over projecting. And so what we can actually do is, is for the blue line, instead of aiming for 760,000 pounds, we can aim for 760 plus 11 percent of that, which is 844,000 pounds. So the outline boxes uh, index the size limit combinations that would keep you below 760,000 pounds, taking into account your projection error. I just want to make just pause right there and make sure everybody's with me at this point. Questions on on that? Are we following? You're good. Excellent. Okay, that was the first major hurdle. So now what I'd like to do is run through an example, and I want to make it clear that I'm not making any kind of official statement endorsing this, but suppose the commission were to adopt the conference board recommendation. Um, I'll just walk you through the procedure that would result in the correct size limit that would follow the procedure that's outlined in the motion from the council. So uh, the conference board recommendation was 4.75 for the this is for a combat for the fishery CEY. The CSP, the catch sharing plan allocation is 18.3 percent. So that results in a total allocation to the charter sector of 869,000 pounds. So you then multiply that by 1.11 to inflate it by 11 percent. 
that would give you a new target of 964,000 pounds. And the charter motion asks that you first raise the lower limit to 45 inches. Is there a pointer on here? Is that the top button here? Okay, that you raise the, um, it's just going to shake all over the place. Uh, that you raise the lower limit to, um, where is it there, uh, Bruce's head, to 45 inches, and then adjust the upper limit as appropriate. Since we're aiming for 964,000 pounds, we go across here, and this cell is the highest projected harvest that's still below 964,000 pounds. So that's, you're right back to a U45068. And that's the, that's the procedure, basically, that's outlined in the council's motion. Thanks for the hand. Okay. Um, so now 3A, which is just a little trickier. Uh, again, they ask for a whole slew of things to be analyzed. The first step, of course, is to analyze the status quo projection. Same procedure as before. Logbook data, harvest is ex uh, crew is excluded. Um, and for the average weight here, we've had a, a declining average weight in Area 3A. It's been decreasing by about 7 tenths of a pound per year, but not, not real smoothly. It's herky-jerky. So just to be conservative, I use the same average weights as 2013 in each sub-area. Um, and then added um, uh, release mortality of 2%. For the, for the status quo projection. However, when I do the, um, the projections for the maximum size limit on the second fish, I used 4%. So ignore the, the, just get the concept here that we're adding in release mortality um, to come up with the projected removals. The harvest forecast is maybe the key number here, 197,500 pounds, or excuse me, 197,500 fish. Okay, so the measure that was approved, oh wait, actually, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. All right. Yeah, the measure approved for area 3A is a maximum size limit on the second fish. Again, annual limits were not considered for 3A, so you need only look at the rightmost column. So this is a two fish bag limit where there's a maximum size limit on the second fish, and um, this measure was employed in 2007, 2008 in Area 2C, so we have some experience with this. Um, the, the way to come up with these projections is that we assume that 48 percent, well, the data, logbook data, show that 48 percent of the halibut in the harvest are the second fish in each angler's creel. As I, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, logbook data shows the catch by each individual angler. So we can look and see how many of these fish are first fish in the creel, second fish in the creel. So we're applying the uh, size limit only to the second fish, to 48% of the harvest, basically. And this table shows the combined effect of the uh, maximum size limit on the second fish. And the highlighted cells here um, indicate measures that would keep the projected harvest under the blue line. Now we don't have experience with projecting uh, average weight under these size limits in area 3A because we've never had a size limit in area 3A. And we probably wouldn't have as much projection error because um, we'd be using last year's data to make the projections, whereas in 2C we're using data that's quite old from 2010. So there's no adjustment in here for, for projection error based on our uh, error in estimating the average weight. Okay, now the council, as you can see, none of these measures, uh, w without an annual limit, if you look only at the far rightmost column, none of these uh, size limits would give you a projected harvest that was less than the blue line, which was 1.78 million pounds. So the council added uh, trip limits, or a limit. It's not a trip limit the way that term is typically used. Uh, it's a limit on the number of trips that a charter vessel can take per day. So uh, just some, some preliminary data. A lot of businesses in Area 3A make multiple trips 
per day for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, but few businesses do it regularly. In fact, um, this, is, this table shows a number of businesses that do it uh, one to five days, six to 20 days a year, or greater than 20 days a year. And uh, you can see that um, the, there's growth in the number of businesses that are running multiple trips per day uh, since 2009, where it was almost 5% to almost nearly 20% in 2012. And in fact, uh, we have a, the projection or a preliminary estimate for 2013 is it was more like 10 and a, or, or excuse me, um, no, I don't want to, I'm not there yet, sorry, confuse myself. All right, so here, the bottom line, though, is not how many businesses are doing. It's really the amount of harvest that comes on that second trip of the day. So if you cut out the, the logic in this analysis, is if you cut out the harvest on the second trip of the day, um, then the amount of harvest you cut out is the effect of that regulation. So the dark portion of the, the bars represent the total harvest in uh, numbers of fish. The... Um, Dark portion of the bars represents harvest after the first trip of the day. And so these numbers basically represent the uh, maximum potential harvest due to implementing a limit on the number of trips per day. And again, you can see the harvest increase since 2009. Uh, the, the preliminary data using partial year logbook data for 2013 is that we had about 10.5% reduction in harvest in 2013. And if you project that, if you just do a linear projection of that increase, and it appears to be linear, you would get 11.9% in 2014. So the fact, I mean, it appears that this is continuing to grow, at least through 2013. Most of the, most of the second, most of the multiple trips happen in Cook Inlet. So this regulation will have a, a disproportionate effect on Cook Inlet businesses. And as I said earlier, this is a, a maximum potential reduction in harvest that you would get from trip limits. Um, and I say maximum because there are mechanisms that could mitigate the effect of this regulation. Anglers could rebook on another vessel. Um, I guess that's the big one, and it depends on the, the amount of capacity that's there in the fleet. Now, some anglers may not be flexible enough to rebook on another vessel or, or on another date or at a different port, um, or they may have trouble finding a vessel, particularly during peak periods in the fishery. So to kind of get a handle on that, we looked at the uh, amount of excess capacity in the fleet. We looked at, uh, at least for the major ports, in Area 3A, uh, we looked at uh, all the vessels that had halibut permits and what their permits were endorsed for. And uh, it, for each of these, uh, these are ports or, or combinations of ports that are close, close to each other. And the, the line, the threshold line in each area is the total potent, possible number of anglers that could be taken by all the licensed vessels in that area. And it's a little misleading because early in the year, late in the year, a lot of those vessels aren't even operating. So there's just because that's the total capacity of the licensed fleet doesn't mean there's, there's uh, available seats on those boats. You can see that the fleet reaches, or, or in the case of the Central Cook in, Inlet, the anchor point uh, Nanilchik upper left-hand graph there, the, the fleet actually exceeds its capacity uh, during the peak of the season by just a hair. And that's because of multiple trips. This is uh, just taking into account one trip a day. Uh, well, actually, the, gra the graph of uh, angler effort is showing what the total angler effort was. It can exceed the line if they run multiple trips per day. But it shows you where the peak of the season is, and it shows you how far away the, um, the actual angler effort is from the potential maximum capacity of the fleet. But basically, it isn't very informative other than uh, we know that during the peak of the season, there's going to be fewer seats available, don't really have good information, 
And um, in the analysis, I stopped short of of trying to project what the effect of of um, a trip restriction would be. Um, the council, however, let me go backwards here. Wait. Okay. Uh, that is 29. Okay, so I'm going to go back to slide 25. The council, however, did decide to implement a trip limit. And in their decision, they basically assumed that you would achieve the 9.8% reduction in harvest. So, uh, let's see. And they also uh, listed some other factors that they thought would provide the desired reduction in harvest even if the full 9.8% weren't achieved. They thought that on net you would, you would achieve this level of harvest reduction. So the values in this table, uh, in the rightmost row of this table, were essentially reduced by 9.8% to account for the effect of the, the, uh, of the limit on the number of trips. So uh, I'm going to add, go now to one more file. It should be tacked on the end here. J tacked it on. Okay, this is not big enough. Is there a chance we could zoom in, Jay? Thanks. That's perfect. <laughs> Auto adjustment in progress. Okay. All right, so what I did uh, was take the last table you saw, which is uh, in the upper left-hand corner. I took out the rightmost column. That's now column B in this table. It's the projected total removals without a trip limit as a function of the size limit, and then I added a column C, which is to reduce that by 9.8%. So you get the removals with a trip limit in place, and you see highlighted in the gray cell the council's uh, motion, which is for a 29-inch maximum size limit with trip limits, and that makes a projected harvest of 1.796 million pounds, which is about 16,000 pounds above the blue line recommendation. And then the council motion asks that if, if the council adopts a combined catch limit that results in a charter allocation that's large enough to remove the trip limit, that you would do that. And that would require a 9.8% increase above 1.78. Uh, which would mean that you would need 1.991 million pounds under a 29-inch size limit, which is right there. Just move to the left. The same size limit without a trip limit. The charter allocation would have to be at least 1.991 million pounds. If the council were to not to adopt a catch limit that resulted in a charter allocation that wasn't that big, but it was above 1.7 Nine, six, then you would just move down this column to find the appropriate size limit. So the example, like the example I gave before with the, um, if the, if the IPHC were to uh, approve a catch limit that was suggested by the conference board or adopted by the conference board, I'll just run through that example. And that, uh, let's see, where is this? That was, where did I write that down? Here we go. Okay, conference board recommendation was 10.73. So these tables at the bottom are the allocations under the catch sharing plan, and you see that for area 3A, 10.73 is in the second tier, which means there's a fixed allocation. It's not a percentage. It's a fixed allocation of 1.89 million pounds. So if, if the allocation to the charter sector there is, is not as high as 1.991, so the trip limit wouldn't be removed, then you would stay in the trip limit column and just move down here to the largest uh, projected removals that was less than or equal to 1.89, and that would correspond with a 31-inch maximum size limit on the second fish. And that's it for 3A. That's it for my presentation. I hope that helps people digest what the motions uh, prescribed.
see if there's questions from the commissioners uh, on uh, Scott's presentation. Paul. Yeah, Scott, I um, was quite interested in the calculations he went through. It reminded me of some of the ones we went through this uh, year, uh, well, last year now. It seems like this year still. Anyhow, 2013. And uh, we instituted uh, oh, uh, some size limits, and, uh, and lo and behold, once that all played out, uh, we were under what was the recreation allocation. And I guess, I mean, this is a bit of an experiment for you, uh -huh. and so you, you used all the information. It sounded like you might have a bit of a better, better database than what we had, so that should help the calculations. My question is, though, I guess on the um, trip limit, that one seems to be a hard one to actually um, enforce or monitor. I just wondered what your comment would be about that. And how big does that really play into it? I'm not really sh uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ryle, I'm not really sure uh, exactly what will come of this. Um, the the first iteration of the proposal was to um, put the limit on the number of permits that could trips per permit rather than trips per vessel and that was subsequently amended in the council process and I think the the reason they did that is they thought people would just acquire an additional permit but now people could just acquire an additional vessel I can't really predict what will happen out of this or or how much excess, ang I mean, I, I held short of trying to predict how much, uh, what the actual effect of a trip limit would be, because I, all I can say is what the maximum is, the minimum would be zero, it's going to end up somewhere in that range. But the council was pretty confident that there, and I think a lot of it was based on testimony, Jane can jump in here anytime, but um, there was some testimony that that the analysis doesn't really capture the difficulty that people would have finding an available seat, particularly during the busiest times of the season. So I'm not really sure. We don't have any experience with trip limits yet. It's been avoided in the past as a measure because of that uncertainty and because that the impacts would be um, focused on a small portion of the fleet. Okay. Uh, Don. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Scott, thanks for walking me through that. I just wasn't clear on the 2C math you walked us through. There was an 11% adjustment that didn't, that was not in the 3A. What, what, what is that 11%? Again, please. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Lane, the 11% was an adjustment for the, our error in the estimation of the average weight, what the average weight was going to be under that size limit. Uh, we've been off by about 11% the last two years. And so we just tuned the analysis. You, you know, it would be silly to, to see that after three years now we've way overestimated what the charter harvest would be because of our error in estimated average weight. So we use that information to tune the analysis. Anything else from the commissioners? If, if I might just wrap up a little bit, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Commissioners, I, I wanted to um, just articulate that this is a process that the Council and Commission has undertaken since 2012. The difference here is that in the past we've provided this level of analysis for your consideration for adoption under a known guideline harvest level, a fixed number per se. Uh, and so the additional effort or time we've spent taking you through the steps in the analysis is because this is the first time we're doing it under the catch hearing plan where we, we're, we don't know exactly what your allocation will be. So if, after this is all said and done this year, you know, if through your staff you provide us guidance in terms of whether this is the level of detail you want to see in the future or less, uh, you know, maybe we resolve some of the issues about the uncertainty of knowing what your action is before we've even started our analysis. There may be some other fixes that that uh, can be explored um, offline. Okay, thank you. And, and I, there's a great appreciation for the work that was done with this. When you do contingency, when there may be several outcomes, it, it's several times as much work. So uh, I've never seen Scott upset or mad. He just does it. So. Th thank you. So let's see. Uh, we have other regulatory proposals to go through, uh, and we will have a chance for the public to comment. 
how many people would want to comment on this one? I see some anxiety in the audience, and so since there's just one person, Bruce, let, comment on this, so, and then. Uh, Thank you. No, then there's. Oh, this is Bruce Gabris and Scott Meyer. If you could just share with us the uh, uh, how do you get to the catch release mortality one? How do you estimate the number of fish released, and what's the mortality calculation? I didn't hear that during your brief. If you could do that, I appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. If that's a reasonably quick response, please do that for us. I'll make it as reasonable as I can. Um, <laughs> So I talked about this yesterday. It's the reason I didn't go through it today. I, I briefed the commissioners on it yesterday. Uh, the estimates, the numbers of released fish for the projections now, I'm using logbook data. And, uh, and for the 2013, it's a preliminary estimate that's based on partial year logbook data compared to uh, past years with a regression and then a uh, time series forecast of what the releases will be in 2014. Used uh, assume mortality rates of 5% uh, for the Area 3A charter, 6% for Area 2C charter, 6% for Area 3A private, and 7% for Area 2C private. And that, those assumed rates come from an analysis I did in 2007 which is based on data. It's a, it's a, they're weighted means of assumed rates for fish released on circle hooks and other hook types. And I can uh, get with you later. Well, I know you know that report, Bruce. So the same mortality rates as the earlier study. And then um, the size of release fish is actually uh, a modeling exercise basically predicting the, the proportion of fish released as a function of their size. And it uh, includes some data from, it, it looks at patterns in other fisheries. It's sort of a meta-analysis. It looks at patterns in other fisheries to see what proportion of fish released as a function of their, their length percentile in the catch. And um, that, that's probably the hardest piece to explain, that we don't have any size data on release fish, so we use this modeling approach to, to come up with what the SSC characterized as, as uh, plausible estimates of the size composition. Uh, those estimates probably overestimate the average weight of release fish a little bit because the way that modeling is done, the smallest release fish can't be any smaller than the smallest harvested fish because there's no data below that, that point. And I know that people are releasing fish smaller than the smallest fish harvested in our sample. So there's probably some estimation error there. In the projections that I showed you, I assumed because the release mortality in 2C was the magnitude of that was about 5% of what the harvest was, I inflated the harvest estimates by 5% to come up with the total removals in 2C. And for the maximum size limit on the second fish in Area 3A, I inflated by 4%. We don't have ex any experience with that in 3A. But the, uh, we, without a size limit, we had about a 2%. The release mortalities represented about 2%, the magnitude of the harvest. So I just, I could have used halfway between that and 5. I just thought I'd be conservative and use 4. So. Thank you, Scott. So, Mr. Pearson. Uh, it's just a quick comment. Uh, I hope that all those who came rushing into the room when we opened it up thinking they were going to have a continuation of this morning's discussion aren't too disappointed about what they've ended up hearing so far, um, but which is consistent with our view of need to, to look at regulatory proposals. Um, I do have one question, though, about the principle, which is defined in here on figure four or related to this document. In particular, the language which suggests the catch sharing plan anticipates that IPHC also divide the annual combined catch limits into separate annual catch limits for the commercial and charter halibut fisheries. So I, this, is a, this is a new plan, and maybe that's the purpose of doing so for this year, but maybe it's guidance from you, uh, Bruce, about whether, in fact, that's an ongoing expectation. As you know, from a cane standpoint, we don't seek uh, IPHC discussion about how we allocate between commercial and, and uh and the sport and, and uh, First Nation fisheries, 
So I just want to make sure we're understanding about whether there's an expectation that we, this is the case with this, because it wouldn't seem to me to be a consistent uh, role. So it's a, we'll let Mr. Cosimo explain it. Thank you. Um, and I, perhaps that's, I, I don't know, I'm not sure exactly where that language came from, but if I wrote it, I had meant to suggest that the commission would apply the council's allocations uh, that are implemented through the catch hearing plan. What, was that clear? Uh, right, if I might, through addition of my uh, colleagues, it's the same policy that the commission applies in the adoption of other catch hearing plans, catch hearing plans into Area 2A and the North Pacific Council's 4CDE, where the, uh, the allocations are embedded within the catch hearing plan. Your action is to adopt the catch hearing plan and then things happen underneath that action. Thank you, Jim. Were there other, uh, Ms. Parker withdrew her question, so were any other questions on catch hearing plan regulatory proposal? I see none. What's the next one, Bruce? <clears throat> I'm sorry. So, so, no, no more PowerPoint. So this is the Sablefish Pots and 4A proposal, is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, Jane DeCosimo, staff with the North Pacific Fishery Management Council. I'm speaking to a letter in your briefing book, I believe behind the same tab. It's dated September 24th, 2013, uh, and it is, um, uh, it addresses a, a um, action that the council took earlier in 2013 on a, a, an industry proposal that was originally submitted to the Halibut Commission in 2008. And a, um, following the council letter is an, a, a document dated March 19, 2013. That's a discussion paper that I, along with others, uh, prepared for council review at its April 2013 uh, meeting. And midway through the document, uh, there is a, a copy of the actual proposal that originally was sent to the commission and was forwarded to the council from Dr. Lehman. And later in that um, file, there is also, as, a, as an attachment number three, is a letter from Ms., uh, excuse me, Dr. Lehman to the council from September 24, 2009. It's, it's on the commission letterhead labeled copy. Uh, that conveys the proposal from the commission to the council. So it is a commission action, or, or um, it's under the commission's authority to define legal gear for harvest of halibut. And while the commission had the unilateral authority to uh, address this proposal, it decided to consult with the North Pacific Council in terms of how it might affect management of the domestic fishery in the North Pacific. Uh, and it was placed in the hopper, so to speak, with a number of other um, proposals to the halibut and sablefish uh, IFQ program in a call for proposals that the council undertook in 2009, and it took a couple years to get to it, what with the Gulf Halibut Bycatch Action and its uh, catch hearing plan. Um, action, uh, it just took a while for this one to uh, resurface on the council agenda. So there were two uh, versions of the discussion paper, uh, a shorter one, and then uh, the council asked for an expansion of some additional information. And so that is the document uh, labeled item D1C. It contains um, a fair amount of detail on a number of different management topics that were identified by the council's IFQ uh, committee. Uh, prior to the Council's uh, consideration of the proposal in uh, the first discussion paper. Uh, so the, the action, um, just following that general description of the documents that you have in your briefing book, um, the original proposal recommended that the Halibut Commission amend its regulations to allow the retention of Area 4A halibut that are incidentally caught while targeting sablefish using pot gear 
in the areas of over overlap with the Bering Sea and Aleutian Island sablefish regulatory areas if the harvester holds both halibut and sablefish IFQs to cover both those harvests in the area that overlaps between the two fisheries. So in the letter, I have a graphic that highlights the area uh, of, um, of, that would be affected um, by action by the commission and potentially a complementary action by the council because there is also a place in federal regulations that under NIMS authority uh, has, uh, has defined legal gear and it would need to be amended to reflect that uh, halibut may be retained in pots should the commission wish to take that action. So there would need to be complementary um, uh, action by, by both the commission and the council and in my discussions with commission staff there, there is a way and there is, has been a history where the commission takes its action and the regulations are written in such a way that they are in effect under the Commission's authority when uh, contingent upon implementation in NIMS regulations. Um, so there is a need to coordinate between uh, the two uh, management agencies. Um, the Council has also uh, suggested in its deliberations of this proposal that it may wish to consider implementation of some type of management measure that would place some restriction on the harvest of halibut in this fashion so that it doesn't become a target fishery. The council, uh, um, I believe, is, is concerned. There have been ex uh, expressions from the commission staff about concerns that this not become a target fishery, that in fact this be limited to incidentally caught halibut in sablefish pots and, and, and not, not the reverse. So uh, the Council has not identified exactly what uh, type of management it would adopt, but it has identified, and I note in the, um, the letter notes, that the Council may consider implementation of a discard mortality rate or, and or a maximum retainable allowance. Um, and so uh, if there is a, a preference or some guidance from the Commission on management measures that the Council might consider, uh, this would be uh, a welcome opportunity uh, to do that. I, I have heard in discussions with other uh, folks at this meeting that maybe a maximum limit, either a percentage of the halibut IFQs that could be held uh, could be limited. But again, the part of the purpose of this uh, is to minimize bycatch mortality um, in this fishery, and so there's a balance that you might wish to consider and the council may wish to consider in terms of only capturing some of that uh, bycatch uh, if once you put limits on on how much of that could happen uh, uh, under this under this idea. Um, I would also note, and I noted it in an earlier presentation this week, that there is a separate initiative that the council is considering to allow the use of sablefish pots in the entire Gulf of Alaska, where they're uh, currently not allowed, and a component of um, that analysis will include consideration of the allowance of incidentally caught halibut in those sablefish pots in the entire Gulf of Alaska to uh, be allowed. And that also would be an action that we would um, uh, welcome your, your comments on. Um, I, I suppose, it I would assume, I think, that under this action, the 4A action, the, your regulations would be written in such a way to limit the legal gear to area 4A, um, but there might be a, a sometime in the future when the council comes back to the commission and asks for um, some additional consideration for a, either a broader or a different area. I think the idea f under the 4A proposal is this is kind of an experiment to see um, how successful or what level of harvest might occur. The discussion paper does indicate that it's a, it's a fairly small background rate of halibut that is caught in uh, this fishery. Um, I, I wasn't planning on taking you through the paper at length. It has been in your briefing book, but uh, just to, I guess, generally uh, characterize that it is um, a relatively small amount. The last table uh, that follows the discussion paper before you get to your next regulatory proposal uh, actually is a good summary of, of the, the level of background uh, halibut in numbers and then converted 
to uh, net weights. It shows that of um, 4.4 million round pounds of sablefish that have been caught, uh, less than 173,000 net weight pounds of halibut have been caught in uh, pot, pot gear over a four-year, three-year, uh, four-year period. So I'll, I'll stop there, Mr. Chairman, and I'm happy to provide additional information if I can. Thank you, Jane. So, so uh, my mind may have drifted a little bit, but I, I didn't hear you use the word whale. So, so I'm wondering about the, maybe some of the motivation for this. Uh, if you could just touch briefly on, you did mention uh, bycatch and stuff, but uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. The the whale component, uh, uh, the uh, whale depredation by sperm whales and killer whales, is is it does occur in the Bering Sea Aleutian Island area, um, and uh, that is the one of the major motivators for council consideration of the use of pots pot longline gear for sable fish in the Gulf of Alaska because it's, it has been more widespread and growing that whales are depredating on sable fish. Um, I'm hearing anecdotal reports uh, as I've been taking that discussion paper through the process that that is also being noted on Pacific halibut, long line gear also, and I, I don't have information on that. Um, I do have a separate discussion paper on the, the whale depredation issue on sable fish. Thank you. Comments from the Council Commission? Mr. Pearson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Jane, uh, for that. I notice, as others will have done so, that uh, our two advisory groups gave different uh, views on this proposal that completely uh, opposed views. Um, PAG's report has quite a detailed explanation of the reasons for their oppo uh, opposition. Uh, whereas conference board only indicates that they support the proposal. Uh, and I think there's also an indication, I'm reading again, about the position of the, of the commission staff in the letter that uh, Bruce uh, sent several years ago. Uh, but I guess I would like to get better understanding of, of, I think, Jane, you answered some of the issues that PAG seemed to arise. You don't, this could create a directed fishery, and you're saying it's, it's not the intention, it's incidental catch, but it's, you know, it allows what it was a previously prohibited gear type to be used, although again, as you might say, for incidental reasons. I just want to get a better sense of, of uh, weighing the risk factors here that clearly led PEG to make one decision and conference board to make another, and maybe not only for you to answer, but others might want to comment on that as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioner. I'm, I'm not sure I heard uh, I gave presentation, brief presentations to both of the groups, but I wasn't necessarily there when the PAG had its discussion. So I don't know uh, what issues it addressed beyond what's captured in, in its minutes. I would like to note, though, that um, if, the, if both groups were relying only on the blue book, the blue book only contained the letter. It did not contain the discussion paper. So I think they, both groups may not have been fully informed of the scope of the discussion paper contents to, to know how um, some of their questions would have been addressed by the paper and perhaps by me if I knew the concerns they had ahead of time. You know, I only gave a, a relatively brief presentation to the conference board uh, towards the end of its meeting yesterday and uh, there, there wasn't really an opportunity to do that. They may have benefited by uh, uh, having been distributed the full discussion paper. Some of the issues that uh, they, um, the comments that I had heard, I believe in, in both rooms, uh, suggested that um, some of the concerns were bec because they didn't have sufficient information. And so it, it, it may, and that some of them were interested in seeing the council analysis to know what the council uh, restrictions might be on this uh, gear before uh, some members felt comfortable supporting it. Uh, and it, it's not to say that, you know, we're often in a situation where the council puts X amount of effort into a project before it, it knows whether it's going to actually move forward with it. So this is only a discussion paper because it wasn't actually taking action to amend federal regulations. That would come at, a, at the step 
after it heard back from the Commission whether this is a viable uh, alternative, whether this is something that the Commission would support further examination. So um, having said that, while it might behoove the system to have a, a definitive uh, direction or answer from the Commission, it is still possible that if you were to say, we are interested in moving forward, but we need to know what it is, how you would constrain these harvests that would give the council direction to move forward with the reg amendment, but perhaps, again, perhaps not adopt it until it knows whether the commission also would adopt it. Because there's a fair amount of effort going into development of a regulatory amendment package, development of rulemaking, et cetera, to not then move it forward through the system without the complementary action uh, by the commission. A couple of points on that of uh, clarification. The, the actual full analysis was not included in the blue book, but was references on our web page. It's also on the CD that was distributed with this thing, so that analysis was available. Um, I think the last point you raised, Jane, is the interesting one. I think the, from the, the staff's perspective, when we set our letter in a conceptual sense, we're not uh, dealing with this, but if the commission were to talk about adopting, uh, changing its, its definition of a, regular, of a, of a prohibited gear, um, I think it would want to know what it was buying, if you will, and, and without knowing exactly what the measures that the council has in mind for something like this, it's kind of like buying a pig in the poke. So one of the one of the one of the thoughts that we'd have in the staff on this is to have our two staffs work together to flesh out exactly what those um, recommendations might be in terms of restricting this to an incidental fishery, which was which was the concern that that had been expressed. Um, in my letter and as, as well as by some of our user communities so that we had a, a much better picture to put in front of the Commission so that they could consider this uh, as as to what their decision might be. Bob. Um, Jane, on the first, on page one of the uh, March, it's, it says March 2013 uh, agenda item uh, D1C. Uh, there's, you've got some uh, number two, uh, which one did I want to talk to? Um, uh, 2A, removal of the pots from the, the grounds once the uh, person's uh, quota was uh, exhausted. And that would uh, presume be this black cut quota. Um, you see where I'm looking? Okay. When I, when I read your, this, this, this document, um, it, it seemed to dismiss that because enforcement doesn't, uh, at sea does not have a pot hauler and can't remove the gear itself should they find it on the ground. And I, I don't, is that the case? Was that what was discussed or is, was that the intent of what, uh, was that the intent of, the, of what, what you what the council is, is suggesting that that's not doable because enforcement can't haul the pots? Well, again, this is just a discussion paper, so there was no action per se. Um, this was, uh, an, uh, and, and the way it was posed by the council t for discussion is the requirement to remove mm -hmm. the pots from fishing gear at the end of the season. And so I, I think um, I, I, you can see it's only a couple, what, two short paragraphs in terms of, right. of storage that I've addressed. So if there's additional guidance that you or the Commission as a whole have back to the Council, we can explore something in more detail. Mr. Chairman, I just, Please. we're going to deal with this when we make the final, uh, an action or non-action, right? Yes. And, but just, uh, it would seem to me that uh, if someone has chosen to, he's fished, he's fished his black cod and all of a sudden he's got a salmon tender job or he's going to go salmon seining and he's he chooses to leave this pots because it's convenient for him on the grounds, um, and and it is found that you know those that pot number is out there for a while and is causing a problem for other gear types. The Magnuson Act uh, provides for a very high fines per day, and it seems the Coast Guard come along and say, "Hey, clock's ticking on you. You got X days to remove your own pots." Um, and, and 
enforcement wouldn't have to have a hot pot hauler. It seems like there's a built-in um, incentive for the pot guy to remove his pots. Now, I'm, I've, I would say 90% of the time, the, those pots are very ex expensive, very valuable. They're going to remove the pots when they're done because they know there are trawlers and other gear types out there, and they don't want to lose the, the, you know, the investment in those pots. But I have had situations on, in 2, 2A uh, where a guy's dropped 500 pots out there and spent three months in the shipyard. And, it, and what happens is that trawlers don't see those buoys. And, um, and he, the doors, you can imagine the doors going through that gear and, and then you got a mess. And uh, it's not just a long line versus pot issue at, at, at once someone abandons their gear. So I, I think the analysis you know, could be beefed up on, on the viewpoint of different gear types having a problem there. And um, I think it's, it's more, um, you don't have to remove the pots just because they're there. If, if they're identified as being in violation, then, then the onus is on the boat owner or the, the owner of the pots to remove them and ching a ching ching enforcement's going to get some money. Well, Mr. Chairman, um, Commissioner, I think the, the reason that a, a lot of effort wasn't spent in the discussion paper on that topic is that um, storage of pots on the fishing grounds after the season is over is prohibited now. So when I looked at this issue, it was in the context of this narrow application of the allowance of halibut to be retained in pot store in, in sablefish pots, and not this broader issue of enforcement or management of the sablefish pot fishery. So that's why this doesn't have a lot of, of meat to it, because it's already not allowed in federal waters. After, after the season, though, that would be uh, November 5th, maybe, November, November 7th, maybe. You know, the, the, you know, the management issues that come up often when we're exploring a component of a fishery often applies to the whole fishery. And then it becomes a question of how much does the council wish to change the management of all of the pot fisheries because we don't have a sable fish pot in regulation, we have a ground fish pot. So once you start adjusting what you want to do for this specific application of halibut to be retained in sable fish pots, you're affecting the cod fisheries, you're affecting other fisheries also, pot fisheries. That, or you're defining sable fish pot gear uniquely. And that brings up enforcement and management issues about how do you distinguish those gear types when they're deployed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, we can talk about this later. I'd I, I just say that uh, if this is going to be an experiment, I saw that there was maybe seven vessels participating in the pot fishery in your paper here. It just seems that this is an excellent opportunity to run an experiment with a limited number of pot vessels because once you move into the central gulf, if that's where the council wants to go with uh, pots for black cut, you're dealing with currently about 400 vessels targeting and you got a, a huge potential conflict of, of, with the pots and long line gear if you haven't resolved that problem in your experiment. So <coughs> that's it. Thank you very much. Any other questions of clarification, commissioners? Any of the public wish to speak on this? Well, I find it a little ironic that almost every discussion we have here talks about bycatch and how the impacts of that. Here we have a proposal that suggests that we deal with some bycatch issues uh, at no cost of the resource. There isn't going to be more halibut taken. And other than Bob speaking for it, it, it appears that it's raising more questions. I, I think Bob has analyzed correctly in my mind. Let's do an experiment. If we have concerns with, with the uh, riders on it, uh, attachments, uh, you're worried about whether it becomes a directed fishery or something, 
the council can put things on that. It's seven vessels, and if we don't take opportunity of this in the light of all of the discussion that comes on bycatch here, I find it completely baffling. So, uh, so Mr. Mr. Pearson. Well, I'm, I'm kind of baffled too. We haven't voted, have we? No, we haven't, but, but we're looking for a discussion on this, I believe. The comments that I hear are largely negative. We have the PAG who has recommended that we don't do this. Uh, Wiley also had a strong recommendation about bycatch, and so I'm looking for some dialogue to try to understand why there isn't uh, more interest in, in taking a look at a, a completely positive way forward to deal with bycatch. I'm in favor, but we haven't voted yet, have we? So. Uh, we have not. Thank okay. you. Okay. Not particularly. Anything else on this? If, if there's a public that wants to make a comment, I'm happy to hear that. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, excuse me. Oh, so Malcolm Mill, North Pacific Fisheries Association, and uh, yeah, thanks for your comments, Dr. Bosigar. I just wanted to just, um, you know, if you were looking for support for this proposal, I mean, the conference board discussed it, you know, pretty pretty much at length, and we thought it was a, for the exact reason you mentioned for the bycatch issue, we thought it was a really good, um, you know, measure to take a look at and to uh, to move forward with. So, you know, I just hope that you feel that there's a lot of people in that room that were definitely interested in, in pursuing this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Just one sentence. You know, at the, the conference board, the board was a very representative. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm sorry I've had a temper tantrum. <laughs> Anything else on this? Thank you. Another proposal, Bruce? I'll make it quick. There was one other proposal um, by Rex Murphy of dealing with U32032 halibut separately in the management, and there wasn't support partly because um, the commission doesn't have the data to to move forward on that. Any comments, David? I would like to comment on this, and um, for the benefit of the. Canadians that are in the room are listening. This isn't our Rex Murphy, I don't think. Who's a, he's on the CBC. There, he's, a, he's, he's from Newfoundland. He's from Newfoundland. <laughs> I I thought this was a very interesting pro proposal, and um, I was a little disappointed that the conference board hadn't dealt with it. Um, but I understand that they they were very busy, and it was towards the end of the day. I'd like to propose that the IPHC staff take a look at this and um, maybe bring a, a discussion letter or paper back to the Commission at some future date to comment on the doability of it under the I IPHC's uh, mandate. Thank you. You can probably direct staff to do actions tomorrow, if you, usually. Thank you. Heather? Can, can I just add one thing to the catchering plan discussion? That just a quick question, just a quick comment that um, in the IPHC regs for Area 2C, we have a regulation that um, if the fish is filleted, then a carcass would be kept, and that would be something that you would discuss tomorrow for 3A as well. Got it. Thanks. So we've gone through the regulatory proposals, I believe. What does that leave us with in this session? Do we have someone here who was prepared to talk to that? No, 
These are simply a series of articles. These are simply a series of articles on aquaculture research. Um, they're there for your information purpose. Greg, did you have anything you wanted to say about those? Yeah. Okay. 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 Steve, have you got anything else? We believe that is it, Mr. Chair. <laughs> we believe we've gone through the agenda. Uh, are there any public comments on any topic that uh, this is your last chance? I uh, wait, do we have public comment tomorrow morning? We do. Okay. Last chance before we we make the votes in the morning. Was that correct? Yeah. So anything that needs to come before us, it's uh, 420. We would have time. They'd be appropriate right now if you want to make them. Floor is open. Leonard Herzog, I, I went before our North Pacific Management Council um, three times in the for the states to see if we could separate the sablefish season um, from the halibut season, and I don't think it's possible for bycatch issues, which we're trying to avoid, because if people that have IFQ halibut like we do and we're fishing for sablefish, you know, it, there's it's silly to discard. That being said. In uh, the Bering Sea and Aleutian Islands, we're not harvesting in the Aleutians 30% of our sable fish and over 40% of our sable fish in the Bering Sea due to the, sh due to the seasons. Our big boats um, can fish till the end of November and would, can fish from March 1st. And so with a declining halibut resource and shortened seasons, um, we're, we're leaving a lot of really valuable fish on the table. So. Um, one, I would suggest in the future we look at the possibility of in the Bering Sea and the Aleutians, I don't think it can happen this year, of uh, possibly having different time dates so that um, we can extend the season, you know, into late November in the Aleutians where the canneries are open and they want to buy because we're always going to get resentment from the PAG at any, at any length in seasons because they want to keep their plants closed, you know, to be efficient. So the PAG's always going to be voting for shorter seasons. I don't hold it against them. It's an economic decision. It's not a biological decision. And we're leaving a lot of fish on the table. So we, we would much appreciate any length of the season, early or late. And should the commissioners pick the March 22nd day to start instead of the March 7th or 8th date that was proposed at at our side from the harvesters, we'd request that you look seriously at a November 15th closure. I, I think the only feedback you're going to get from, is from your own staff trying to um, get their data, you know, ready for you. I, I don't believe that there'll be fishermen fishing halibut anywhere in, at that time of year. It's just going to be our big sable fish vessels and, and hopefully your staff could accommodate it. So. I'd make a really strong push for a, a November 15th closure day. And last year, the best fishing for sable fish in the Aleutians was in November. And the four boats that were fishing there were on 30,000 pound sable fish trips. The fish, for some reason, aren't available during the summer. And they're available in early March and late November, I guess, because of the circumstances on the edge. Thank you. Thank you, Lenny. Any questions? Seeing none, so, thanks a lot. Can I just so oh, please, Bruce? The question is, I think I might have missed it. What was the council's response about uh, separation of the seasons, Leonard? Well, the the we, the issue of separating the seasons didn't come up, but it, it seemed very clear to me that any effort to try to change to have the sable fish dates be different than the halibut dates would create huge problems that that would be hard to overcome. Cora. Um, who's the um, head of, you know, the ADF and G, mm -hmm. recommended to the council that they send a letter or they include in their letter to this body a request that the season be made as long as possible. And I, I believe that the entire board, that the entire North Pacific Management Council, you know, in response to me, um, was looking for as long a season as this body could you know, could get because they told me that they couldn't help me, that I had to come here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Thanks, Leonard. Thanks, Bruce. Last call. Ms. Barger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and my apologies. But I just wanted to refer to or respond to Commissioner Pearson's question about the PEG and let you know that we were confused on um, a couple of points. We did go into the uh, supporting documents that were online and were concerned about um, Pandora's box concept, just what would happen, what would be the unintended consequences. The, um, one of the first questions that came up was, there, for this ban to be lifted, we understood it was already used in Canada. So we, un we didn't know why there was a need for the ban to be lifted if halibut could be retained as a bycatch in pots in Canada. And Greg speculated on a possible reason, but we still haven't gotten any real reason why we now need to lift this ban. Um, the other concern we had was that the fish that will be retained will go into the market. Even though this is a pretty small amount, it could be really damaged fish and it could affect the market in the end. Um, and I just wanted to say that Heather McCarty spoke eloquently about the conservation concept, so I think we did get that. Any questions? Thank you very much. <laughs> David. Just, uh, hey, Bruce, th I'm kind of aiming this at you. Do <laughs> um, you remember when the commission sponsored an experiment to try and catch halibut in pots? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Um, Mr. Boyce, we, we did catch one. I think actually <laughs> it might have been partly my idea. But um, <laughs> anyway, I don't know how big a worry this is that there's going to be tons of help. Well, if that experiment's any indication, they're not that easy to catch in pots. Thank you. I see no more comments. Uh, I would suggest that we vacate the room, finish up our closed door sessions. We only have a couple more items that will be short and we should maybe, uh, depending on how long it takes people to leave, we might still get out of here by 5 o'clock.